my, the last time I saw you, you, you were several weeks away from the primary and, um, and boy, did you have a primary blowout? I mean, uh, first of all, how does it feel to be the nominee, the Republican nominee for governor of the great state of Maryland? Well, it, it is a great honor. I mean, I honestly um, have wished and hoped that the people of Maryland could have their views re better represented in our party. We have had from time to time um, the opportunity to do that. And sadly, um, when we thought Larry Hogan would do that and, and it just didn't work out for us at all, it was a disaster. <laughs> and the end result has been um, it, more taxes, higher, more spending, literally doubling the budget from 35 billion to 62 billion and putting abortion money in that every single year, um, putting uh, millions into catch and release for the illegal alien program they're doing through uh, from the Southern border with the Biden administration, which is um, you know avoiding the law and also endangering our state. We have right. a significant uptick in some of those crimes with um, you know the MS-13 and the cartels coming here Fentanyl is going through the roof. I mean, that's mm -hmm. our number one killer in Maryland, and that can be direct, directly attributable to the southern border and the fact that we are a sanctuary state. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of issues on the table, and it's an honor to run with these issues and to see cross-party support. I mean, when you look at what happened in the last two years, uh, there is a good 25%, 30% of Democrats that also agree with us that say never again will we lock down our schools, our state, force mask our kids, require vaccine passports. And my opponent, Wes Moore, wants all of those. He's promised to implement whatever the CDC says goes in Maryland. Well, that's an outrage. We would have been still masked now if we had followed that policy. And yeah. it's a disaster with his vaccine passport approach. He literally has that on uh, his requirement to attend his events. You have to show your, you know, your, you've been experimented upon with the EUA <laughs> in order to go to his event. I mean, this is a big issue here in Maryland. We have many federal workers, many military members have been discharged. We're talking thousands in Maryland uh, because of the fact that we are a, a great state for a lot of our federal and military members to live in. And so this is not something that um, the Democrat party wants, um, in at least in a good, good section of that party. And you bring those into the, into the freedom fold with the uh, independent vote. And we have a very good look for this fall for our campaign. Yeah, let's. I was actually curious about uh, just some of the dynamics in the Republican Party in Maryland right now. I mean, um, for those who have not been following um, the Maryland politics, I mean, you crushed your competition. Uh, Kelly Schultz, she's the anti-Trump rhino, endorsed by your equally anti-Trump rhino governor, Larry Hogan. You beat her by double digits in the primaries. What was the key uh, to that victory? Was it was it the reawakening of the rural vote, as it were, particularly in Western Maryland? What what do you see as I mean, you obviously we met uh, at a uh, Mastriano event in Pennsylvania and you're, we're seeing this rise of the uh, the Patriot Republican Party. So, so somebody once called the grand old Patriot Party now. Uh, or do you see something similar going on in Maryland? We certainly had a great turnout in our rural areas and our, our Trump districts, the red districts. A lot of people don't know, though, that Maryland is a very red state. If you look at our county by county analysis and you, you color the map, we really have only three or four counties that um, are right. purple and blue. Um, deep blue, obviously, with, uh, Prince George's and Montgomery. Um, but, you know, Howard and Baltimore City. Uh, Baltimore City is deep blue, but you know, upwards of 25 percent of Baltimore City voted for President Trump. The mm -hmm. minority wow. vote uh, is absolutely embracing the, the concept of individual liberty, of freedom. And they saw that with President Trump's America first agenda with our Republican uh, agenda, with making sure the Constitution applies, civil rights applies, to make sure that our borders are secure. We end the sanctuary state and that we have this increased empowerment of the individual through school choice and through keeping more money in our pockets so that we reduce taxes and inflation. These are the issues in front of us. And that's why uh, I think people turned out for us. But the other interesting thing is the I-95 corridor. Kelly was um, and Larry Hogan were smug in telling the Re Republican Governors Association that they had this race in a lock 
because they were going to win the I-95 corridor, basically. And I could have told you 12 months ago that wasn't going to happen because it was Baltimore County and Anne Arundel County and even Montgomery County Republicans who were furious with his lockdowns because mm. they were the hardest hit. The rural counties were not as hard pressed in many respects with the two year lockdowns of the governor. That's because many of their counties refused to enforce them. They just said, no, we're not going to require you to, you know, we're not going to fine you if you don't wear a mask. We're not going to shut down your church. Sorry. Um, right. you know, but that's what happened in the 95 quarter. And so when you couple that with people li literally losing their jobs, even now, remember now, people are being fired as we speak, uh, Jonathan, because the military is discharging them. The federal contractors are losing positions. Their appeals are not being honored. So there's people that are filing civil rights lawsuits left and right in Maryland, and the I-95 corridor is where they live. Wow. And so we had a tremendous um, response. We had a huge uptick in um, people interested in our campaign in Baltimore County just was on fire for us. And sure enough, we won big in Baltimore County. She thought, you know, my opponent thought she's going to win there. Didn't happen. This is mm -hmm. what we're looking for the fall, because... In the, you know, we have this fake um, uh, candidate on the other side who says he's from Baltimore and he's not. And <laughs> he wants to advance every evil under the sun of the lockdowns. And on top of that, he's made a million dollars a year off of a poverty uh, group that he helped run. While doing that, he made tremendous amounts of money off of a book that he wrote on the back of a fallen officer, a blue line member, he would not be where he is, according to the blue line officer's family, without the fact that that officer died. And then that this uh, this candidate on the other side, Wes Moore, is capitalizing on that with his own book. It's a tragedy. Wow. It's, it's wrong. And we're going to expose him at every turn. And at the end of the day, we believe Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, and all the great I-95 corridor counties are going to come out for freedom because they know what's on the line and they're going to vote for our ticket. Well, you've got, I mean, you've got some precedent there. There's no question. I mean, look what happened in Virginia with Glenn Youngkin, um, Jersey. I mean, my, they almost flipped uh, very, very close to, to winning that governor's race. Uh, I think of Ed Durr, who was able to defeat Steve Sweeney, the, the uh, Senate president in Jersey is one of the most powerful politicians there with just a few hundred bucks, which makes it so sweet. But uh, the analysis in those elections were that we, we saw the continued migration, the, the defection of the working class away from the Democrats. Uh, of course, they were the uh, they were the base for the right. New Deal, Demo the FDR Democrats. But you said it beautifully at the beginning where you said there's just there's these Maryland voters who feel like nobody represents them. I talked to people right. in Britain right now, you know, with going after Bojo just uh, had to uh, say hasta la vista or whatever he said in his last <laughs> see a baby or whatever it was that he said, you know. They, they, they're like, it doesn't matter who replaces them. Nobody represents us anymore. Just the working class Brit same kind yeah. of thing here. And, and I think in, uh, certainly in Virginia, uh, New mm -hmm. Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, um, uh, one of the exit polls found that white working class women. So these are women, uh, no college degrees. Again, historically, Democrats voted for Yunkin 75 percent. Are you seeing comparable shifts, particularly among working class voters? Uh, to the Republican Party in Maryland, like we're seeing in in Virginia and Iowa and Ohio and Pennsylvania. Yes, we are because the mama bears is what we um, we lovingly call them are out to protect their children. They're tired of what's being uh, taught in the schools. They're tired of being cut out of the loop. They don't want their little boy in kindergarten told that he can take a chemical uh, behind their parents' backs when he get you know because he wants to to switch and become a girl or, or talk about, you know, him as, uh, as someone else using various pronouns behind the parents' backs, uh, moms and, and papa bears, both mama bears, papa bears, the parents, this is part of our base movement. I mean, we had a parents for Dan Cox movement, like none other, 
We have, you know, over 1500 volunteers came out and not everybody were Republicans. Some of them were moms right. had their children psychologically harmed with these lockdowns and the forced masking. I had one mom yesterday message me saying, uh, one of her friends said, wow, you're not as moderate anymore. You used to be kind of a middle of the rotor, um, you know, independent minded Democrat. And, and now you're like all gung ho for the Republican Dan Cox. And, you know, what made the change? And she she texted videos of her son wow. weeping, her son, who was apparently in second grade, weeping because of the lockdowns and his inability to understand what was being taught on Zoom and his feeling like he was failing and becoming a failure and his mother just had had enough and she said this is the number one reason why i am working for you to make you the next governor because mm -hmm. we know something you care about the children you care about making sure this never happens again and you're the only one willing to do it and yet here's wes moore out there bragging about he's going to implement new lockdowns with the cdc if that's what they ask for so this is never it never could be more clear of an issue. And when you couple that with the CRT and the gender indoctrination, mm -hmm. uh, you've got a, a trifecta of concern with the average parent and family to say, no, we, we can do better. I mean, look at their friends in Florida or Tennessee or uh, right. in other states that are not, Texas. that did not do as uh, severe lockdowns that are taking action to make sure that parents' rights are protected. And, and what do they hear and see? They see better opportunities for their children. So it's either let's win this and get this back on track for our beautiful state, or some of them are saying, or we're out of here. We're going to go to Florida. Yeah. And I'm telling them, yeah. please don't, please don't move. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> let's, we can win this and we can get Maryland back on track. We're the beautiful state right here in the central east, um, mm -hmm. in the mid east. And it's, it's, you know, something of our heritage that we should not ever let go. We're the heritage of what's called the free state or the old line state. And that's because we had everyday Marylanders that stood up against tyranny. You know, 400 Maryland uh, old line mil militia uh, persons worked, uh, fight, fought with George Washington, stood up against the British, 10,000 British. And at the end of the day, we won our freedom. We've got our national anthem right there in the harbor flying with Fort McHenry right. Uh, right. Uh, from Francis Scott Key. This is a the birth one of the birthplaces of our of our liberty, and our constitution reflects that. Our constitution protects the individual actually more than the Bill of Rights. We have a a wonderful Declaration of Rights, and so when you look at that heritage and you see that you know people here are reasonable, they're looking to see what are, what are your practical policies. Let's let's do away with the name calling and the innuendos and the ridiculous politics, and let's get into the meat of this. Will you debate? Will you have a discussion on the policies and what will you do in Maryland for my family? Are you going to lock us down? Are you going to continue to have a 30 percent property tax increase? And my answer to those things are no. And are we going to continue to indoctrinate behind parents' backs? No, we're going to end these things. We're going to put us back on track. And that gets people excited. Absolutely. Oh, you got me excited. I mean, I lived in, for those that you don't know, I lived in Maryland for what, 12, 13 years, you know, when we met, I told you, I studied at Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore. And yeah. uh, I, could, I could still remember the first time I visited the Inner Harbor. It was at nighttime and it was so beautiful. I couldn't believe it, all the lights and, and. Can't go there now at night. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, you know, that's the sad that's, thing that's about it. That's, that's part of the issue. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, because what I mean, because you know, I mean, I've I've been out in Garrett County. Uh, I'm I'm a mile away. I'm in Delaware, but I'm a mile away from uh, from Cecil County border near the near the Walmart uh, up here in um, William Chevrolet. Um, you know, I mean, Maryland's such a beautiful state. I mean, when you go out west, it's like it's got those rolling hills and mountains like West Virginia. You come all the way out to the coast and you, you have this gorgeous port city like Annapolis or Baltimore. I mean, it's an amazing state, but yeah, I mean, it just seems like uh, Baltimore when my wife and I visited again, oh, I think there was a 10 year gap. And so for whatever reason, just raising kids and so forth at one level, we were stunned because there's a lot of gentrification down at the uh, inner Harbor. But at another level, it was like, it got, it got worse. You could see the dilapidation, the social, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, falling apart as it were. What, is there anything that could be done with, uh, yes. with something like Baltimore? Yes, Baltimore City is our flagship city. It's one of the best ports in the nation. 
really in the world. Um, and it's been allowed to be overrun by the cartels and the gangs to the point now where you cannot go into the Inner Harbor area with your family at night without fear of being shot. That's how bad it is. Fells Point is a beautiful place to go out to eat yep. right down from the Inner Harbor, Little Italy. In all of these areas, uh, wonderful people have, for no reason at all, just simply leaving the restaurant, have been shot dead. One guy was mm. shot after bumping one of the, um, you know, the, the gang members on the corner. He accidentally, allegedly brushed him with his arm as he was walking. Um, and the guy turned around and shot him dead. You know, the cartels and the gangs are trying to take over the city. Basically, they have done so through the uh, state's attorney who has created a revolving door. Now, it looks like she has been unelected. That's a good thing. Um, but the, one of the issues that I intend and I've run on this is, and I'm the only one saying this, is we're going to have an immediate meeting uh, as governor. We're going to pull in all of the city leaders and meet with an emergency meeting to say, this is what we are going to do. This is what the experts say. Uh, to get control of this crime and the, the blood running in the streets. Literally every day there's a murder. And that only reflects a portion of the people being shot, Jonathan. Listen to this. In, uh, from the last reports I've seen from Johns Hopkins surgeons, they're dealing with multiple shot victims a day. And they're saving lives. Uh, that's why we don't have more than about 365 murders a year in Baltimore City, is because of these great surgeons literally are saving thousands of lives every year. But for every person that's murdered, um, uh, there's about three to five, maybe even upwards of seven that are shot, but live. And those statistics aren't talked about. That's how bad it is in Baltimore City. So we have an emergency meeting. We say, this is what needs to happen. This is what the experts say need to happen. This is how you police. This is the police commissioner needs to get on board with this. The mayor needs to get on board. Literally, the mayor does nothing. He lives by himself with his own little security detail, and he shows up for uh, some press conferences, and everyone in Baltimore is furious because he does not address this issue. In fact, there are posters going up all over Baltimore City right now saying, missing in action or missing, please uh, reward for finding him. And it's the picture of the mayor, <laughs> literally the picture of the mayor, missing, please oh, reward for finding him because yeah. he just is that he's not serving. And so once we get control of this through the prosecutorial status and the policing, that's an immediate action item. And then if they do not implement that, the Constitution authorizes the governor to take a receivership, to put this into a third party system that says, until this crime gets back in order, until we get a judge's order that we can then uh, you know, release this receivership, we have to make sure that our streets are safe because this is part of Maryland also. Um, and and I, I'll do everything that with, with that's constitutional within the power of the governor. I mean, if we have to bring in the, um, you know, the National Guard, uh, mm -hmm. we will do it. And no mm -hmm. one ever was afraid of doing that. You know, sadly, in the last eight years, it's gotten worse under this governor. Mm -hmm. Sadly, nothing has been done. Uh, mm -hmm. The current uh, state's attorney allowed rioting and burning of police cars and of shops and basically said, let them, you know, do their stuff, you know, basically uh, stood back and watched it all burn. That's not yeah. going to happen. Or we have got to get a handle on this. And we can. You look at these great cities around the country that are, are safer. I mean, we're number two for the murder rate. We're beating, yeah. Chicago. We're beating Chicago for our yeah. murder rate. That's horrific. Yeah. But if you look at some of the, even, even New York with all of its trouble, uh, New York has a much safer street climate. So we know that this can be uh, fixed and we're going to work on it right away. Yeah, it's so interesting because, uh, I mean, you look around Maryland or or places like uh, Oregon, who feel uh, the rural uh, populations that feel so alienated from these urban populations of just massive crime, particularly Oregon with Portland and Antifa basically running the city. Uh, they're even talking, trying to do some kind of secession, right? As a mini secession to, for Maryland to join West Virginia or Oregon to join a greater Idaho. Uh, if you know, whether they could legally do it or is, is almost besides the point. It just shows how exasperated people are with uh, with feeling, again, they're going right back to your original point, feeling like their concerns, their values, their interests are totally ignored in the midst of a politics that's become radically cosmopolitan and and very urbanized um, and and in the process is, is just very you know far left given the the power structures that tend to oversee those those population Absolutely. centers 
It's sad. It's very sad. And that's why as part of our primary campaign, we launched what we termed Project Not Forgotten because wow. the Western, Western Maryland, Southern Maryland, and the Eastern Shore, the rural areas, have largely been ignored by Annapolis. They have no seat at the table. And the money is billions of dollars are being poured into the city areas and into the central part of the state, while literally the other parts of the state have zero support with their policing, very, very little uh, infrastructure support. And yet they're carrying all the weight. In fact, in many regards, a lot of their money is being shipped into Baltimore City schools, where the schools have a 1% um, a one percent passage rate for their children, yeah. uh, with the you know standards of basic reading, writing, and arithmetic. This is horrific. Yeah. So, while we work on Baltimore City, we have to also make sure that we bring everyone to the table and and ensure that Maryland once again is represented, the entire state is represented, and that our values are implemented statewide. That no more are we going to have Antifa running the show. You know, we're not going to have people intimidated like what happened with the Senate president where they Antifa literally surrounded his home and intimidated him uh, into basically some concessions in my view. And that's not going to happen anymore. You know, if, if you have these thugs doing that kind of thing, we'll do what it takes with the Maryland state police. I will issue the orders necessary to stop the terrorism. It's what it is, is terrorism. And here they, they went from the Senate president. Then they went over to the Supreme court justices homes and nothing, nothing was being done. Finally, uh, our governor did. Uh, finally, our governor did issue some state police protection. Uh, this has got to end. We have got to go in immediately and and protect our citizens. That's what the Constitution requires. It's one of the first requirements of government. If you're going to have any government at all, it's to basically make sure that the peace is there. People can drive on streets and they can go. Yeah. Leave, leave them alone to go do good. You know, to make money, to have families, and to to do what uh, we do best as Americans and. And that's not, you know, really the the vision in the future of most far left Democrats here in in uh, in Maryland. But it is what most of Maryland wants. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, just that deliberate abdication of law enforcement responsibilities was such a shock, I think, to so many people. And I think it's definitely coming back to uh, to bite them, as it were. Dan Cox, where can people? Uh, we'll have a link uh, down below under the video. But where can people? Um, go to find out more about you and perhaps even help out with the campaign? Well, thank you. So uh, you can go to coxforfreedom.com. You can sign up. You can make it a donation that's secure there. You can help us. We are a grassroots effort, Jonathan, as you know. And so we need to have everyone on board and we can win. We've demonstrated it. They spent over $4 million to defeat our primary campaign and we won with half a million we can win in the fall, just like Larry Hogan won, because the people are tired of big government overreach. You know, he he had one hundred thousand dollars when he won his primary and the Democrat, Anthony Brown, had seven million. Mm, and yet wow. yet he went on to win. And it, we won because the grassroots got behind him at the time, thinking that he was going to be conservative. I can promise you I will stay conservative. I will make sure I govern for all of Maryland. I will never compromise our principles. Our Constitution is too precious too many graves, too many people have fought for our liberties and have given their all to give that up. And our children, I'm a stakeholder. Our children need a future. You know, my wife and I have 10 kids and we are proud and blessed to uh, to have that opportunity here in Maryland and to provide for them in the future. But we're not going to have a Maryland for them to live in if we don't take charge of this now. So that's why I'm running. I'm asking for everyone to come on board and help us. Coxforfreedom.com and I greatly, greatly appreciate any and all help that we can get. And thank you for the opportunity to be on here with you. Oh, absolutely. I would love to send you as many people as possible. Again, a huge uh, congratulations to you in the primary win. But again, it wasn't even close. I I mean, talk about just kind of walking through that finish line, uh, swirling your cane there. It was pretty cool. You hit it out of the park there. And we'll be excited to follow you and root for you all the way into November. Uh, So of that red wave is going to ride right through uh, Maryland. So God's blessings on you, Dan. And thank, thank you so much. If I, could, if I could say one more thing, uh, doctor, sure. if your listeners can understand, um, I'm assuming many of them uh, look at Maryland from time to time as, as some have joked, you know, as, as too liberal, you know, too, uh, too out there. And, and I just want them to understand Maryland is very much like Pennsylvania, very much like Virginia. We are, 
Uh, not a, a heavy, heavy, hard blue state. We have a lot of Christians, a lot of Republicans, a lot of rural farmers, and um, just America first people all over. We, you know, in the black community, for instance, the churches are some of the biggest in the nation. Um, and I'm reaching out to them. It's exciting. And one of the things that I need everybody to hear me and understand on this is that what happens in Maryland impacts every other state because the Democrat Party, the DNC, likes to use Maryland as kind of an incubator for their policies. They've been doing this in Annapolis for years. We saw it with the gun ban. We saw it with the uh, uh, gay marriage. We saw it with the attack on traditional values in the classroom, which is now being marketed across the country with CRT and gender indoctrination propaganda. These are the issues in front of us and it's being uh, pushed upon the whole country. In particular, the lockdowns that happened here that was, you know, we have, and a lot of people know this, we have the NIH in Maryland. We also have uh, many, many big pharmaceutical companies here. They base their efforts and their work right out of Maryland. And their, you know, their focus and effort is to market their forced vendetta of forced vaccines, forced masking, forced healthcare. In other words, to take over our daily lives and our healthcare. That's something that they want full control of. You can go to myirmobile.com and you can see that this is their agenda. You can go to connecteddmv.org and you can look at the what's called the Global Pandemic Center in Rockville, Maryland. And what they're doing is they're taking these issues and trying to change our constitution and say mm -hmm. that the individual has to now acquiesce to whatever the powers that be order them to do with their health, which if they don't, what happens in the future and what will happen is that people lose their custody over their children. People lose the opportunities that they have with their work. They will be fired and terminated. It's happening already as we see that. So I want people to understand my race is to protect not only Maryland, but mm -hmm. to stop this madness where the CDC and the NIH is, is headquartered right here. We got all of these health officials pushing their policy through the World Health Organization, which, by the way, has a direct channel to the legislature and, and that I serve in. They, the Health and Government Operations Committee chairwoman is, is on the board at, with one of the international uh, entities that is uh, with the World Health Organization. And if you look at the World Health Organization's policies, they're pretty much mirrored um, in many of the bills that are put in the Maryland legislature. So what I'm trying to explain is this is an essential issue for the entire country, but particularly the East Coast and particularly Maryland, but for those who aren't Marylanders, you can help me out. It will help you as well. And that's my pitch. And that's my wow. hope that they can see that. That's it's, it's true. It's not something I'm not a, cons you know, don't believe the lies. I'm not a conspiracy <laughs> theorist and all that craziness. <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm a pastor's kid. I'm, I'm a, you on okay. whack and all that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and all that. Yeah. I don't but, even know what but that Dan, is. But Dan, they're, but, but Dan, they're the first ones to put forward all the conspiracies, whether it's the Russian collusion or whether it's Trump and Democrats colluded to make sure you want, I mean, they're the first ones to throw out all the conspiracies. That's the bizarre thing. It Talk is. about projection, it you know. It is. I wonder who really is running things, you know, that's with this, some of these uh, conspiracies. Uh, you know, anybody, in any case, my point is this. We have a constitutional mission to uphold the rights of the people, and that is across all party lines. I am a blue-collar background guy who works hard for a living. I have my own business. I work hard. I'm not a politician, but I need help because you can't beat the system. You can't beat the machine without grassroots support and without at least enough donations to be able to run TV and, and media. That's right. So Amen. that's my request. And it's a great honor, uh, doctor, to be on your show. And I appreciate all you do for our freedoms here in America. So, and, and for the Lord, God bless you. Hey, God bless you, everybody. Make sure you click on that link below and visit Dan's website. And let's, uh, let's ride the red wave in through Maryland. God bless, Thanks. Dan. Thank you so much. God bless.